Welcome to Sanford on the Hill. It's my pleasure to welcome to the stage uh, Duke University President Vincent Price. Good evening. It is wonderful to be here. I'm delighted to welcome you to the U.S. Capitol for the annual Sanford on the Hill celebration. And I understand from many that uh, this event long predates my time at Duke. Um, and I'm honored to carry on this delightful tradition. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many Dukies of all ages here to join us this evening. Uh, not two weeks ago, I completed my first year as Duke's president. And uh, many of you, uh, even many of our Curtin students, uh, have been part of this community longer than I have. Now, the benefit of being a relative newbie is that it provides, it provides some opportunities for a comparison. So Durham, for instance, has much better winters than my previous institutions. <laughs> and our dogs, in particular, seem to appreciate that. Uh, we had a delightful snow, as you may recall, in January. It was about 11 inches. Perfect snow for the dogs. And the best part of it, it was gone in three days. Uh, it also led the governor to declare a state of emergency. Uh, I've also learned that Duke's alums are much more active and passionately engaged uh, than our peer institutions. And I, I think it's either the lemurs or basketball, perhaps, uh, but it is extraordinary. And it is one of the great uh, assets of our university that we have such enthusiasm for the Duke proposition. And one of the things that I found most striking is that at Duke we have forged uh, very strong bonds between our campus community and the policy world here in DC. And that relationship is a direct result of the active engagement of the Sanford School of Public Policy, which is one of the great assets of our university. Uh, between Duke and DC programming, uh, the political and policy expertise of our Sanford faculty, immersive learning opportunities for our students, and our commitment to rigorous research methods, I strongly believe that Sanford does provide the best policy education in the United States. Uh, and uh, I have to admit here, I am a little bit biased, as I am the president of our university, uh, but also a member of the Sanford faculty. And one of the great joys of coming to Duke One of the great joys of coming to Duke was joining such a, a fabulous faculty at Sanford. Now, at the same time, Sanford is helping Duke project its scholarship into the policy conversations here in Washington. We're wor working to build a first-in-class policy bridge between our academic work in Durham and, indeed, around the globe, uh, and policymakers and elected officials here in DC, and the goal is to turn our rigorous research and the potential for solutions that we identify um, into uh, novel opportunities for the public in ways that can, in the words of James B. Duke, uplift our region and uh, the world. Now, we have a wonderful, delightful program this evening, uh, which we will be getting to very shortly. And I know you're excited, as I am, to hear from our distinguished fellow Dukey, uh, Judy Woodruff, about the latest goings on uh, in this building where we're sitting and uh, the one a little ways down Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, but first, a very, very special guest. My first year at Duke was a period of transition with three of our eight deans uh, returning to the classroom or taking on new roles at the university. And I'm pleased to report that after nationwide searches, eight of our 10 deans uh, are women at Duke, including, <laughs> including uh, Carrie Abrams uh, from the University of Virginia, who, will, uh, who is uh, stepping in as dean of our law school. Toddy Steelman, uh, alumnus of our university, who will be dean uh, of the Nicholas School for the Environment, and tonight's very special guest, Judith Kelly of Stanford, of Sanford, rather. Um, many of you in this room know Judith from her 15 years as a Sanford professor, 
uh, a role in which she mentored scores of students at Duke, uh, and in which she was awarded the Susan E. Tift Undergraduate Teaching and Mentoring Award, as well as the Bernal Wetton Award for Diversity and Inclusion. Dean Kelly earned her undergraduate degree at Stanford and her MPP and her PhD from Harvard. She is a distinguished scholar of international efforts to promote democracy around the world and to prevent human trafficking. And she's the author of three books and numerous articles. Since 2014, she has served as the Senior Associate Dean of the Sanford School, responsible for faculty development and for research. So she steps into this role admirably prepared. I have the utmost confidence that Dean Kelly will build on the tremendous progress made by Dean Brownell and that she will lead the Sanford School to an even brighter future. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Dean Judith Kelly. Thank you so much, Vince. Uh, we're very glad to have you on our faculty, and we're still working on your teaching assignments for next year. Um, intro to public policy, uh, 120 students. I can see you have the touch. It would be great. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you so much. And I think it's very fitting, Vince, that you are here tonight, not just because you are a member of our faculty, but also because Vince's own degree is in mass communications. And so the connection with uh, our distinguished guests here tonight, Judy Woodruff, uh, is very apparent, and much of your own work, uh, Vince, speaks to um, uh, how we can dialogue across divides, how we can learn to articulate the viewpoint of the other side, and, uh, and that's why it's very fitting that you lead our university at this time, and that you're here tonight, so thank you. Um, thank you to all our friends and alums, our supporters, and members of the Board of Visitors who have shown up here tonight. Um, to so many of my former students that I've seen here tonight, welcome. The DC fabric uh, is so important for our school, and I can't think of a more fitting place for me to have my first public event as dean. So I'm really pleased to be with you tonight, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I, am, I am particularly pleased that Judy Woodruff is with us here tonight. Uh, and I will give a more formal introduction towards the end of my remarks, but what I want to turn to tonight is I want to make, I, I want to make a brief, some brief points about uh, some similarities that I actually see in some of the challenges that the modern university and we as a public policy school face, and some similarities with that and, and the media. Uh, I think our institutions serve some similar roles in society, and we face some similar challenges. Uh, uh, particularly at this time, uh, one of the challenges that uh, we face is a deep skepticism towards our institutions. There are many people in society that feel like higher education has become alienated from society, that the values that we promote um, uh, don't resonate with them or that we are isolated from the world. And uh, that's something we have to take very seriously. There is also a very um, a changed funding environment that we face in higher education and in public policy. And that's a challenge for us, just like a changed funding environment exists also for the media. Uh, there is a questioning of facts and science that we face in higher education and that also is shared with the questioning of facts in the media, uh, and that is something that is a challenge for us in higher education right now. And finally, we have a challenge uh, of technology, I would say, in figuring out uh, how uh, we deliver our education in a way that is uh, making use of technology, because what is the value added of the on-campus experience when there are technological uh, uh, alternatives? And also, how do we educate a workforce that fits with the technological developments in our society? So I think that these challenges, technology, 
funding, challenges to fact, and the skepticism towards our institutions are very important at this time and is something that is shared. But I think it's something that we, as a public policy school, are very well placed to lead on because a public policy school sits right there in the intersection between the university and the outside world. And it is our responsibility to lead and meet these challenges. And this is something the Sanford School has done before. Over 45 years ago, Terry Sanford, who was president of the university at that time, had a vision, had a vision for a school where young people would come together and they would study different topics at the same time, economics, history, ethics, political science. They would be interdisciplinary. Interdisciplinary was not a word at that time. It was not a thing. But that was the vision of public policy, that it should be applied, that it should lead in serving the knowledge of society, which has become the motto of Duke. And there, Sanford led both on the front of interdisciplinarity and in knowledge in the service of society. And we're prepared to lead again as we face these challenges. Like the challenges of skepticism towards our higher education. That means we have to lead by hiring a more diverse faculty, inviting a broader set of speakers to our campus, and educating citizens who have a broad mindset to understand the whole range of perspectives. When it comes to the challenges in funding, that can be an opportunity for us to partner more, to partner more with people in the real world. Indeed, Sanford, to begin with, wouldn't have come into existence if it hadn't been for the fact that there were donors that were willing to give to the university so that the school could be built, because it was their investments that built the school. And so we have to, to figure out new ways to continue to partner to overcome some of these challenges. When it comes to thinking about facts and science, as President Price talked about, we have to meet these challenges by connecting earlier on with policymakers and with the people with whom we want to share our science. We have to build relationships so that there is that receptivity. And that's a good thing because that means we have to listen up front as we start our research and we have to bring it into the classroom. When it comes to the technological challenges, for how to prepare students for the, work, for the future workforce and how to deliver an education that is value-added value on a campus, we have to figure out how to break down the barriers between research, teaching, and engagement with the outside world. And that will enrich the entire enterprise of all of these endeavors. And so I believe firmly that the Sanford School can do this. We have led in the past and we will lead in the future. And I'm confident we can do this because, one, I am biased, but we have a fantastic faculty, and that's great. We also have some of the smartest students in the world. And we have a fantastic body of alums who inspire our students on a daily basis, and they inspire me when I go to meet them. And so we have the ingredients we need to meet these challenges. And that is important. Because Franklin Roosevelt said that democracy cannot succeed if those who have to express a choice are not prepared to make a wise choice. And therefore, the foundation of democracy, he said, is education. And that is important at this moment in time more than ever. And I believe that the media and the university, outlets like the News Hour, that we are together in the mission of educating at a time like now. And that is so crucial to our democracy. I know that I am standing between you and Judy, so let me not take up any more of the precious time we have tonight. So let me introduce, first of all, Fritz Meyer, who is my colleague. Uh, <laughs> Many of you know Fritz Mayer. He's been at the Sanford School a long, long time. I don't even know the number of years anymore. Uh, any aspect of the Sanford School that exists today, uh, Fritz has somehow touched. He is also the uh, director 
of the, our Center for Politics, uh, uh, Leadership, uh, Innovation and Service. And then, so welcome and thank you, Fritz. And, um, and then we have with us tonight Judy Woodruff, and it's such an honor to have you, Judy. Judy is the anchor of uh, the PBS NewsHour and uh, co-editor, is that right? Co-editor as well. <laughs> and has uh, covered politics in this nation uh, through some incredibly interesting times, though maybe none as interesting as now, I don't know, we'll hear your perspective on that, Judy, tonight will be very interesting. But I want to thank you for your many, many decades of service and support for your class at Duke and for uh, uh, the support and generosity that you have shown towards the university and towards the Stanford School. So, friends, alums, Members of the board, everybody here tonight, please join me in welcoming Fritz Mayer and Judy Woodruff. Well, um, lovely to see all of you and welcome and and Judy, uh, just uh, thank you so much for being here uh, this evening, and, and welcome to you. It's really a great treat for me personally. Uh, thank you, Dean Kelly and President Price, for letting me do this. This is a, a wonderful treat for me, and on behalf of everyone, thank you for being here. I know it will be a real treat for all of us. Well, it's a treat for me to be here. It was just a hop, skip, and a jump across the uh, 14th Street Bridge uh, to get here from our studio, which is actually located in Arlington, Virginia, for any of you who haven't been uh, at WETA, the Washington uh, Public Television Station, but that's where we do the show. But I, I am thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to congratulate President Price on his first year, very successful first year, and to welcome Dean Kelly as you begin your uh, time as dean uh, after uh, the service you've given at, at the Sanford School and coming, coming from Stanford. Um, I, I have to say, before we start talking, whenever I walk into the Capitol, and especially if I'm on the House side, I have flashbacks to the, time, the two summers that I spent in Washington as an intern between my sophomore, I transferred to Duke after uh, two years at Meredith College in Raleigh. That first summer, I worked here as an intern for a congressman from Georgia, 10th District, Bob Stevens. His office was on the first floor in the Cannon Building. So I knew that building cold. I knew every corner, nook and cranny of it. And then the next summer, I had been at Duke for my senior year and came back and was lucky enough to be asked to return. So I, I can't walk into the Capitol without thinking back to Duke, to being an intern. And maybe some of you had the intern experience, too. And it, maybe it shaped you as it did. Well, you obviously got the bug, and I think probably others will uh, are getting it as well here. Those uh, students are currently interning. Um, what we thought we'd do this evening is, is uh, Judy and I have, would have a brief conversation. Um, there's not much to talk about uh, in the world. Uh, just kidding. Um, uh, but we have a brief conversation, and then we want to open up for questions. So be thinking of questions. There are mics here on the floor, and we'll turn to, to, to questions. But we did want to have a a little bit of a conversation on really about two topics. Where, where are we in our politics? And a little bit about the state of the, of the media. So uh, meaty topics to be sure. We're certainly at a tumultuous moment in American political history. I mean, you think about the, the divisive nature of our politics, the extreme partisanship, the kind of toxic quality of the conversations around immigration. Who knows what this conversation will be like as we move forward to the Supreme Court confirmation hearing. As we speak, the president is Euro in Europe, um, uh, stirring things up at NATO, uh, about to meet with the uh, president of, of Russia. Um, um, it's just so much. Um, a few years ago, uh, uh, Norm Ornstein and Tom, Tom Mann wrote a book said it's, uh, by the title of It's Even Worse Than It Seems. And I'm not sure it's gotten better but, it, but there is a question really about whether, I mean, on the left, it, it seems that democracy is kind of hanging by a thread and it feels really kind of chaotic. I think on the right, uh, conservatives would say, this is, this is a little bit hyperventilating. There's, there's a kind of 
uh, Trump derangement syndrome going on here. The mainstream press is, is overstating it. Where are we in your view? Is it worse than it seems or does it seem worse than it is? Wow. Well, how long do we have? <laughs> um, it, it's, it's an excellent question. It's, it's on the minds, I think, of, of many of us. Um, I have to say I've been in Washington 40 years. I came here to cover the Jimmy Carter administration and cover the White House through into Ronald Reagan and then and have stayed ever since for some reason. I kept, you know, I had to, I had to keep uh, asking for jobs somewhere, but I'm still here. Um, it's, it, I've covered Democrats, I've covered Republicans, I've covered transitions from one party to the, to the other. I've covered uh, elections that kept, you know, the same party in power, uh, Reagan to George H.W. Bush. I've covered parties where the incumbent was, was kicked out as, uh, as George H.W. Bush was when Bill Clinton won. And so I've seen, I've covered tough campaigns. I've covered rancorous debates in this city. But I have to say, Fritz, I've never covered anything. We have never covered anything like what we see right now. Why? I don't have to tell all of you. It's because we have someone sitting in the Oval Office who didn't come out of the traditional political establishment. He came from the world of business, the world uh, in, in recent, more recent years of reality television. He was someone who really was a, has been a master at keeping himself in the, in the public eye. And he's brought those talents and those skills to the White House. Um, and he does, you know, we had a, another discussion about it tonight on the program. We discussed what happened today at the NATO meeting in Brussels. And I had two guests, one of whom uh, said, look, um, this is a president who ran on being a, dis on a disruptor, on turning the, the regular order upside down, and that's exactly what he's doing. He's doing what he said he would do in many, in many respects. People vote, some people voted for him, those who voted for him, many of them voted because they thought Washington should be turned upside down. They didn't like what they were seeing here. And then, I mean, without spending too much more time on history, there were others who, are, who are, were and are aghast at what they're seeing. So how you view this, I mean, you said this in your question, Fritz, but how you view this really does depend on where you sit. If you, if you wanted someone to come to this city and turn it, it literally inside out, that's what you're getting. Um, what we don't know is what that's going to lead to. Uh, for example, in immigration, is, are, are we going to... Are we going to see a permanent change in immigration policy? Are we going to go back two or three steps after, after making four or five steps in another direction? How much are these foreign policy moves going to last? How much are the changes on tariffs and trade going to last? There are so many things that are still playing out. But what we know right now is that we, are, we in the media are being asked every day to deal with an, a, a nonstop stream, a fire hose, if you will, of news and information that we have to figure out at the end of the day, how are we going to cover it? What we, what's going to be more, what's more important? What deserves more time? And those are the kinds of decisions we in the press have to, have to decide every day. And we, we all come at it differently because of the different kinds of reporting we do. It's a, it's a tall order. You alluded to, you have this, um, one of the reasons this is so fantastic, you have this amazing history of having come here at the beginning of the Carter administration, now the six, I guess, six presidents in, and so a perspective on that. I'm curious, you, you pointed very directly at President Trump as the sort of decisive factor in the current context, but how much of this, how much of what has happened in Washington was actually, in, you know, it was happening before Trump. How much is he a symptom as much as a cause of what's going on? Well, there's no question that what we're seeing today had its seeds decades ago. I mean, I, I kind of trace it in a way to the early 90s when you had uh, President Bush 41, H.W. Bush, turned out of office by Bill Clinton, who was viewed by Republicans as an interloper, somebody who... They, many of them, I mean, I remember people telling me to my, to my face and anybody who would listen that this man didn't deserve to be in the Oval Office, look at his behavior in Arkansas, um, and, and, and the White House has been uh, overtaken by people who shouldn't be there. So there were really hard feelings on both sides. You had Newt Gingrich came along a couple of years later with a contract 
for America and this very hard-charging partisan approach. Yeah. I think it's cemented through the 90s. 2000, what happens? We have an election uh, that is disputed for 38 days. We don't, the Supreme Court ends up making a decision. Yes, George W. Bush is, is named the, the winner, but Democrats go away feeling resentful and worse, feeling they've had an election stolen from them. So the resentments piled on resentments. You, you're then into the, into the 2000s, and there was that brief moment of, of comedy, of, if you will, uh, you know, kind of a, a, an unbelievable coming together after 9-11, of all yeah. things. And I think we all, all of us who were around then, remember that. It, the, the partisanship just faded so quickly. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, we all were sitting around thinking, is this going to last? Is this? And of course it didn't. Um, there were disagreements over what to do in Afghanistan and Iraq, foreign policy and domestic policy, and we, we were off and running again. And there we were in 2008 with another very contentious election, Barack Obama, uh, John McCain, and then, and then here we are. And I don't have to recount every election for you, but you're right, Fritz, the seeds were, were sown, I think, more than any. It's not that we didn't have division before, but it's played out in a much more visceral way. To the point that today, I mean, I like to tell people, when, when my husband and I started dating, this was back in the late 70s, early 80s, we would go out and you'd, you'd see Republicans and Democrats together. So they socialized together in this city. They were friends, they went to lunch, dinner, they brought their, members of Congress brought their spouses to Washington, their children went to school together. They knew each other as human beings, as people, as friends. Over time, that has faded. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, the members don't get to know each other across partisan lines. So for all these reasons, and then I, you know, you may want to talk about it, money. It costs so much money now to run for office, not just for president, but to get elected to the Congress. And the need to raise that money to do what your party says you need to do to get them to help you raise the money, it has driven us apart. And we are now at a point where I have never seen us as split and as angry as we are today, and it's not just in this city, it's around the country, and we can talk about why that is. But it's, uh, you're right, the seeds were there, but we are worse today, I think, than we've ever been. What a gloomy, gloomy that, that, um, <laughs> that, message. It, it is a little gloomy. Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about some, uh, uh, some positive developments. Uh, there are some things out there that are happening, um, I think. Sure. One of which, of course, is extraordinary number of women who are running for office this year, a uh, record number. There have been other moments, 92, with the so-called Year of the Woman. There have been other moments in our history, but I think we're, we're well beyond that now. Um, there is a political energy out there. Do you see that? I mean, that's another thing that's changed. I, I suspect a lot in your time in Washington, um, the role of women, uh, in the media, probably uh, in politics in general, uh, is is that a, is that something we can look to as a as something that's positive that's happening? I hope so. I mean, we'll see. I mean, I I, I can say this in a bipartisan way uh, that I hope I think it's good for all of us if more if more women, more people of color, if we have a more diverse uh, 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 Congress, if we have a more diverse government, a government that looks like the country. I think everybody can agree with that. And by the way, I want to congratulate President Price again on having, is it eight out of 10? Fabulous. Um, women uh, deans at, uh, at Duke. Um, we, we are seeing, I think, more women running this year, in part because of President Trump. I think there's some reaction to him. I hear re my Republican women friends lamenting that there aren't as many Republican women who are coming forward to run. Of course, they don't have as many women, there aren't as many women, Republican women in Congress as there are Democratic mm -hmm. women. They're trying mightily to, to address that, uh, but it's just been harder. I think more of the energy at this point, at least in terms of running, has been uh, on the Democratic side. But, you know, that, that can change. I mean, we see these things shift. And I think, um, uh, I think if, as long as these women can figure out a way to raise the money, because it comes back to raising money, and as long as they figure out a, you know, that, that, that path to, to winning some of these seats that look very gettable right now, 
but may well turn out to be harder than they look because of things that we can't possibly foresee, things that are going to happen this fall at the national level. Some of these races are going to be played out for local reasons. Some of them are going to be impacted very much by what's going on here in Washington. President Trump is going to be active on the campaign trail for Republicans. So there's so much yet to play out. We don't know whether there's going to be uh, an announcement of uh, a report by Robert Mueller, the special mm. counsel, before November. There's a lot of speculation that there will be, but we don't have any way of knowing. So there's so many variables playing out. There's been so, um, there's so, been so much commentary about uh, a word that political scientists like to use a lot, institutions, the role of institutions in our politics, in a sense that some of the institutions, the norms, the habits that we didn't really pay much attention to that really were the grease that held us together are really under threat at the moment, that norms of behavior of how we talk to each other. Talk about that. Do you see that as, you see that as, a, as a major problem? Do you think that this is a blip, that we, we will return back to some of the traditional ways of engaging with each other? Or do you see lasting damage from this moment? Well, I hope it's not lasting. I will say that I thought, I thought what Dean Kelly had to say was very important about the institution, what, what higher education, what education uh, in general, higher education and the media have in common right now are the things that you listed. Um, the, the lack of de declining trust, dramatically declining yeah. trust in the case of the news media, the questioning of facts, uh, and so on. So we share that. These are two institutions that share those challenges right now. But there are others. The, the, the church has, been, has had its own set of challenges. Uh, the court system. Uh, the, look, at, look at today with our Supreme, the debate going on with this latest appointment to the Supreme Court, and it wasn't, and of course this is not new. The courts have increasingly appeared, I think, political to people. This nomination appears political to people. It's hard to believe that it was only a few decades ago that people like Justice Scalia won uh, confirmation by, what, over 90 votes. I mean, it, 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 it's just in, in the matter of just a, of a few years, we have gone, we have taken what was a, a common um, appreciation of the court, the role of the, of the, role of the, judi of the judiciary, to something today that just looks very political. And I, I marvel at, at, how, at how changed that is. So I'd like to be able to tell you, Fritz, that, <laughs> that I think that it's just a blip, that we're going to get through this. But I think my, um, my experience, having watched the media over time and, frankly, having, being on the receiving end right now of a lot of comment from the public. As you know, the public can comment regularly, and they do. Uh, about the work we do and about the work all the media does. And some of it is very favorable and very appreciative. Some of it is very, very critical. Uh, and it's coming at us from a partisan standpoint. I'm, I have to say I appreciate the fact that at the news hour, we get criticism from both sides. So I, we're trying very hard to plow that middle ground to try to always be listening to the voices on both sides and letting our audiences uh, decide for themselves. Well, I wanted to turn uh, directly to that very, very important institution, the institution of the media. Um, you know, political journalism is, is at, the, at the heart of democracy, and the, you know, democracy depends on an educated public. Thomas Jefferson much quoted saying if he had the choice between a government without newspapers or newspapers without government, wouldn't hesitate to choose the latter. He had some other moments where he wasn't as happy with the press, but that's the one. That's the one that's um, most most uh, um, most quoted. It does seem to me there's a, a paradox of the moment, which is that it has never been easier to be informed. In a way, it's easy through the internet to get information if you go looking for it. You can dive deeply. You can go far. And yet, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm wondering whether you you feel this. It it seems to me it's also at least in recent times, never been easier to be misinformed or perhaps easier to be in an echo chamber where all you hear are, are the views of people like yourself. Is, is that what you see from where you sit? Absolutely. I mean, I, I often use the term, I, I, it feels we're swimming in a sea 
of news. From the moment you wake up in the morning, from you check your whatever it is, your smartphone, whatever device you look at, from the time you go to sleep at night, and it's not just those of us in the press, we do it because we have to and we want to, it's what we do. But the public now does that, and then you can, it's coming in on your news feed. You don't have to wait to pick up a newspaper. If you still subscribe to a newspaper, or you can turn on the television or listen to the radio. The news is coming at you from every direction. It's social media, it's online, it's everywhere. And you're right, we now have access to extraordinary amounts of information. We can, if we want to read a Supreme Court opinion from earlier this year, we just have to go online and we have it in five seconds. Uh, so we have access to information, information and news at the touch of a screen or of our thumb hitting um, the screen on our, on our smartphone. But at the same time, a lot of that information is, I think, I know, is being manipulated by one side or another of our great political debate. And so I think it's, it's become harder on news consumers, on ordinary Americans who are smart but busy uh, and don't have time to go wading through all this to figure out well, okay, is that right? I mean, is it true that, um, that Germany is uh, uh, dependent on Russia for 60 to 70 percent of its energy, um, as the president said today? I mean, how do we quickly figure out whether that's right or any number of other assertions that are out there? It's harder for ordinary people to know what's going on. And so I think we are now entering a phase, and thank goodness our kids are getting a good education, most of them, because they're going to need that education in order to become um, able to, to, to figure out what news to, to take in, what news to believe. Hard, it's going to be harder than ever for our children, our grandchildren today, as they grow up, I predict, uh, to, to discern uh, what, what's real and what isn't. And I, you know, I like to say it's the legacy brands, it's the New York Times, it's you know, CBS News, it's the News Hour, it's whatever channel or news organization you, you trust, but that trust, I think, is going to become more important than ever as we go along. I think that makes sense. Some of us have been thinking about what, uh, what kind of skills uh, our students and, uh, need to be citizens in the future, and one of the things we've really thought a lot about is how do you, how do you curate your media environment? How do you, how do you, how do you ensure against uh, being in a, trapped in a bubble and only hearing things that are fed to you by some algorithm? Uh, how do you discern between the legitimate and the, and the illegitimate news? You have to go to what you trust. And how do you do that? You go to sources that you know have been reliable. You know, what news organization, what news source can you pretty much count on is going to give it to you straight? Um, you know, wh wh who hasn't messed up a lot in the past? And whether it's I don't know. I mean, you know, you, I've seen these surveys recently, or actually studies, not surveys, I'm sorry, of different news organizations, and people look at the Associated Press and Reuters, the wire services, and they put them up there as the most reliable, trustworthy, believable, non-partisan. Uh, and you, then you go down the list of some television news organizations, um, and, and then you come, you know, frankly, to cable, cable news is is somewhere in there but you yeah. it gets more partisan and the same thing with print but people today are going to have their own views often based on where they sit politically and um, what my passion today one of my passions is that we teach the next generation that they are going to have to strengthen those news organizations that are credible and that they can count on, that we don't dissolve into just a, okay, that's your version of the facts, and that's my version of the facts, that we somehow, you know, cling, you know, find a way to respect, to build up, um, and preserve those sources of information um, that are factual, that are truth, because if we don't, what do we have? I mean, our democracy depends on um, information that the public can count on to then make decisions yep. about how to act as a, as a citizen. So it all hangs together. And um, it's another reason why education is so important. Um, on top of what we're talking about, uh, and you alluded to this a little bit in your earlier comments, 
There is a, a, a strand of criticism or attack on the, let's call it the mainstream press, the traditional news um, media, including the news hour. That's of a kind we haven't really seen before. That is, uh, and you heard if you looked at the president's remarks saying that Montana uh, last week, uh, um, a, a kind of a statements about the, the mainstream press, that it's fake, that it's not real. This seems to be believed by a non-trivial fraction of the public. How do you, how do you uh, sitting where you do, how do, you, how do we cope with that? How, do we, how, how much damage is that doing? What, what is, how, how do we push back at that? If you are, in fact, a, a real journalistic enterprise, as you are. Well, in the short run, I think it's doing a lot of damage because the polls show that a surprisingly large percentage of Americans believe the media is mainly not to be trusted and mainly fake, or just we make it up, or we deliberately put out information that is not true. Um, it's kind of it's a remarkable change to me. It's not that people thought the media was perfect. We've always been criticized, but it's I mean, after you have a candidate and then the president basically repeating over and over again that the media is fake, the media is not to be trusted, and the media has an agenda. That's clearly sunk in with a lot of people. And they're not just on the right, they're people on the left who think a lot of the media isn't, uh, isn't leveling with them. So I, I worry about this. I, we all in the media, we talk about it a lot. We talk about how do we deal with it. Um, it makes me angry when I hear the president say that reporters uh, uh, and people in the media are the enemies of the American people. Uh, that is not the case uh, for, the, for the reporters I know and I've worked with for my entire career. Um, it, it's, it's just false. It's not true. Um, having said that, I don't think it serves us in the press at all to get into some sort of contest with the president. I think the best thing we can do to um, build up um, the kind of trust that is so important that we were talking about a minute ago, is to do our jobs the best we can every day, to um, you know, go out and dig those stories that matter, come back with the facts, with the information, share them with the American people, and, and just keep on doing our job and let the chips fall where they may. If people don't like it because you reported something that, that uh, was factual, so be it. I mean, that's always been the case. But we, if we lose our credibility, if we come to a point where we truly are not reporting information that you can take to the bank, that, that you know can be borne out, it can be proven, it can be backed up, then we've done, we've done ourselves irreparable damage. So we have to keep working at it. Every day I tell my colleagues, you get up in the morning, you know, tie your shoelaces, go to work, and just go back at it. Go back out there, report those stories. Talk to your sources, do the document reporting, do the hard work that journalists are supposed to do. That's who we are, that's our role in this democracy, and we have to keep doing it day after day after day. And um, it's, a lot of it's not glamorous, uh, but that's, that's our job. That's, that's what we're here to do. We're not here to get into some kind of contest, uh, uh, of verbal or otherwise, with, a, with any political leader. That's not, that's not what we do. Um, as you can see, I would love to keep just monopolizing the conversation, but um, uh, I do want to open the floor for questions. So if you have a question, please come down and, uh, to the mic. So let me just ask one more question while people are, are queuing up. And, and, and it's really, Judy, uh, about, um, uh, you know, we've been talking about a lot of, it's been a little depressing, you know, the, the conversation. you got to say something yeah. more uplifting before this is no, over. No, but it's, it's, you know, you, a long time ago, you made a decision when you were a student at Duke to major in political science and to, and to engage in, in politics, and then a decision to go into journalism, and you've had a career in public life. And, and I'm, I really, for the students here now who are, are thinking about what they want to do with their lives, it's easy to become disillusioned and say, just sort of give up. And so why, wh what, what, what do you say about why that remains, that is to say, engaging in public life remains something that our students really should do? Because this democracy matters, because this country is an extraordinary, we are all so fortunate to be 
living in this country, to be experiencing, to have the blessings of this democracy that our founding fathers had the great wisdom uh, to, to create. And here we are, all these years later, still appreciating and enjoying the benefits of that, but we can't take it for granted. It sounds like, I know it sounds a little corny or preachy, but I believe this with all my, the fiber in my body. We can't take it for granted. We have to work as citizens every day to uh, make sure we vote, to make sure we take an interest in issues, to make sure we, we, uh, we speak to our, our public officials. It doesn't mean every day, but, but we have to be engaged with this democracy, with this government, or else it will become something that we don't want and we don't recognize and that doesn't serve the American people. I feel so strongly about that. And I'm, I, I just, I have to pinch myself to think that I've been able to work in journalism all these years to be able to ask questions of people who are making decisions that affect the lives of all Americans. Um, it's just, again, it sounds corny, but I love it. I mean, I, I, and I encourage any of you, I assume because you're sitting here, this, you've been sitting here this long, you haven't left, that you think there's something important that goes on in this city, and you're absolutely right, it is. I hate, I hate it when politicians go out and trash Washington, and they call it the swamp, and they call it every terrible word in the book. Some of the finest people I know, the finest people I know, have worked in this city, and they've done incredible things for this country. And so I, uh, I, I will argue with anybody who comes up to me and says, eh, you know, the politicians this and the politicians, sure, there are a few bad apples, but by and large, the vast majority of people I know who come to the city either as an elected or appointed position in the media, they come here because they care about this country. They care about the American people. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here. And I think that's probably why we're at the Sanford School, all of us. So thank you for that. Let me just open uh, up for questions now. We'll start over here. Um, and yes. if you would say your, your name and your Duke connection. Yes. Uh, Carl Golovin, class of 79, domain reference and idea lives on .net. And I'm going to take President Price's admonition to be passionate and active seriously. And uh, Dean Kelly, I did have an uh, interdisciplinary experience at Duke. I started in physics. Touched, touched most of the sciences, ended up with a public policy uh, major, and then continued a year later for a master's in environmental management. All of which didn't really prepare me for a career as a special agent criminal investigator with US Customs, which is what I did. <laughs> and, and that probably is a result of the most important single day at Duke was when a man named Mark Lane, an activist about transparency about the Kennedy assassination, spoke for hours and hours one evening at the Biological Sciences Auditorium, and it really, his passion for transparency in government reminds me that I think, and my question is really more of a challenge, that the public needs to be informed, the public needs a transparent government, we don't have one. And if Duke could lead in a symposium in Washington, perhaps starting uh, on the Duke campus, on the idea of government transparency being foundational to true national security. I was wondering if you mentioned 9-11, I was a 9-11 responder in November of that year for three weeks. And I can tell you the official story is not credible. There's a group, AE911truth.org, that has documented the evidence of other reasons for, especially the, the collapse of World Trade Center 7 on 9-11. So the focal point I would ask is that we have a symposium about transparency concerning 9-11. There is a lot of skepticism, even among former responders like myself. So thank you very much. Thank you. You, I don't know. Do you? All right. Um, uh, so over here. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Alec Lintz, um, class of 2019. Um, so with the rise of social media playing a more important role in media, it's kind of put the consumer at the center. Um, the whole idea of narrative politics has kind of made just re receivers of news feel like they have a greater part. Um, how has the media, how's the role of the media, and how will it change um, in the future, and how will it engage with um, consumers that really feel like they have a part now. Everyone has an opinion. You see these long Facebook threads. How do you think the media will be able to respond um, to people who have conflicting views? Or how will it um, ensure, I mean, you're doing the great work, making sure that the facts are on point. How will you engage with and interact with those people that don't believe you? 
It's a very good question, and we're already trying to do that. We're working really, really hard now. The News Hour, which started out as a television show, is now has a, huge, a big, big presence online and in social media. Why? Because it is the way to reach people today. You have to be online. You have to be engaged in social media from Facebook to YouTube to Twitter to on and on. I mean, Instagram and you name it, and there are many, many other ways. Not to mention, I, I, or I did say online, but we, we are working nonstop now. We have a great younger group of uh, journalists uh, who work at the News Hour who look at ways to take the stories that we do on the air and we, we duplicate them online and put, push them out on Twitter and Facebook and so forth, but to expand those stories and to take them and, and develop them in other ways and to take sidebars to those stories and go deeper. And, and to get to your point about the public reaction, to try to find ways to respond to the public. I mean, I will tell you just uh, this past week, my colleague Amna Navaz, who's a new correspondent for the News Hour, has been in Texas. She's been doing a lot of reporting on the immigrant, the separating families at the border story. She did some remarkable reporting uh, looking at what happened to one little four-year-old girl and her grandmother. Uh, she was separated from her grandmother even though they were uh, asking for legal asylum. To make a long story short, it came down to um, uh, when, when the mother, when the government is finally ready to reunite the four-year-old girl with her mother who was living in the U.S., they're going to need help to, to pay for transportation. We had people write in right away that night saying, we'd like to help. Is there something we can do? Just totally unsolicited. We didn't ask anybody for this. That's just one example. People respond. They, they'll write in and they'll ask for more information. Or in a case like this, they'll offer to help. Where can I send a check? Who can I contact? And it turns out we were able to give them the names of a number of nonprofit groups that have, that have just basically you know, spawned up from nowhere in the last few weeks to help help these immigrants. And we get, and when you get criticism, I mean, there are people who write in who say, why did you report this? You forgot that, you got that wrong. We try to respond to that. Um, but I will tell you, we haven't perfected it yet because there's just, there's so much. We are a team of 130, 125, 130 people. Our audience is much, much bigger than that. We've got almost 2 million people watching a night, many more following us on YouTube or checking a podcast or, a, or a, a segment they may see, you know, on their Facebook feed. And, and they will write in. And we can't possibly at this point keep up with all of that. So I'm hoping your generation can help us come up with, with ways to, to have a more robust interaction with the audience. I don't mean just the news hour, but I mean all of us in the media. I mean, this is, this is something the New York Times is working on, the network, CBS, ABC, NBC, everybody's working on. How do we keep this, gr this wonderful interaction that's, that's grown up between the media, the reporters, and the consumers of news? How do we develop that and, and keep it alive and, and, uh, and do it in a way that satisfies their needs but also recognizes that we can't, you know, we can't respond to everybody. But it's a great question. Thank you. All right, thank you. Over here. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel. Um, Hi. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's quite great to see you in person. Um, mine is actually a bit of a, a personal question for you um, and in your career. So in seeing and reporting on a lot of the challenges um, and seeing the toughest parts of humanity, uh, i.e. war reporting, human rights abuses, et cetera. Uh, it seems pretty easy for one to be seduced into negativity, divisive, divisiveness, anger, blame. What about your job and the way that you have personally approached your career um, has kept you positively motivated and committed to documenting essentially our first rough draft of, of history? Wow, that's a, uh, a wonderful and a, and a thoughtful question. Um, and it's one that I have to, uh, I have to take a, a breath, take a deep breath as I think about it. Um, what keeps me going is knowing that there are people out there who count on information to, you know, to, to live their lives 
and whether it's the immigration story that we're watching right now, whichever side of that debate you're on, I think, and, and in fact, there aren't many people who are on the side of separating families. I mean, I think we've seen that, you know, in, in the fact that the administration pulled back on it. But whether it's immigration, whether it's education, whether it's the tax bill, whether it's North Korea, whether it is, um, you know, what the president is saying right now with regard to, to NATO and our defenses and the Middle East. Every story has some human connection. Um, and that's what keeps me going because I know that people's lives are affected, whether they are people who live in my birthplace of Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Augusta, Georgia, where I went to high school, or whether where my father grew up in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, or uh, Springfield, Missouri, where my mother was born. I think about all of these places. Somebody asked me this question yesterday. Um, you know, what do you think about when you're doing the news? I think about the people I know in those places. And I think about, you know, what do they need to know? And I don't presume to think that we at the news hour have all the answers or that we on any given night are going to help you figure out all the challenges in your life. But if we can in some way help you know more about the human condition, whether it's in this country or in, you know, in a, in, I don't know what, neighborhood in Atlanta or a, um, an issue on the border or the, between the United States and Mexico, whether it's something that happened between the Palestinians and the Israelis, or if it happened in North Korea. Um, if it's a part of the human condition, I believe we're all connected. And so I, that's why I believe what we do as journalists matters so much. And that's what keeps me going. It's not that I never get discouraged. I, I do. Uh, I mean, I was... I was on the set at CNN of the day the towers came down, getting back to the gentleman's first question um, just a moment ago. I watched that happen. How can, you, how can you watch something like that and keep going? But we don't really have a choice. I mean, we have to keep going as a people, as a country, because it, what we are here for matters so much. I mean, for our families, for our neighbors, for our community, and. Our, our country um, and beyond. So that's what keeps me going, but thank you. Thank you. So. We have like a couple minutes. So I was gonna, if it's okay with you to have both of them yeah, ask their questions. Have, uh, why don't you, yeah, good idea. Both of you ask questions and we'll ask Judy to respond. Thank you. Thanks very much for being here, both of you. Um, it's a privilege. Uh, so my name's Steve, I graduated in 2017. Um, I'm curious if I can have you uh, maybe critique your own industry for, for a sec uh, in a non-Trumpian way. Um, I'm curious what your take on um, the sort of coverage of this uh, potential upheaval of the Democratic Party is. Um, people seem to think that there's a real Bernie-Hillary divide, um, but a lot of us who work for um, liberal folks or who work in political communications might see Democrats all over the country, whether it's um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in a very liberal way, or maybe somebody like a Connor Lamb in a more conservative way, in a more conservative district, talking about health care, talking about um, you know, gun rights and gun control um, in different ways and with different approaches, but doing the sort of same thing and running smart races. So do you think that the, um, the media's coverage is, um, is, is really fair or accurate? Do you think it's sensationalistic? And how do you think it compares to maybe other uh, eras of potential upheaval in the Democratic Party in, in your career? So that's a great question in and of itself. <laughs> Good. We'll take one more, and then we'll, uh, you'll weave the answers together. Figure that'll out be, how That'll be fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Hi, my name's Rashonda. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I wanted to get your insights into um, local media. Uh, many organizations that cover local news are currently struggling right now financially. And I wanted to ask you your insights on the downstream effects of that, and how can we mitigate the negative effects of that? Those are two wonderful questions. Um, they, they don't overlap a lot, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, I'll, but I will tackle them, and I'll take the Democratic, the division in the Democratic Party to me is, is just fascinating to watch. Um, after what happened in 2016, the Democrats, I don't have to tell all of you, you follow this so closely, um, the Democrats have been frantically trying to figure out, A, what went wrong and how can, they keep, how can we keep from having this happen again 
which is always what happens in American politics. We look back at the last, the last election, the last battle, and how do we go back and refight it, and how do we get it right again? But of course, the circumstances change two years later, four years later. Um, it's fascinating to me because there is a fight right now for the soul of the Democratic Party, just as there was kind of a fight in the Republican Party for, for its soul. I mean, Donald Trump has kind of settled that for right now. You don't see many Republicans taking him on. Uh, they're, they're few and far between. Uh, at least I can only think of two senators who've spoken up uh, to challenge him seriously. Um, so that, that, that combat on the Republican side is settled, at least for now. But for Democrats, they've got some real sorting out to do uh, between now and November. We're going to be, we in the media are going to be watching these midterm races very closely. There's some fascinating races. You mentioned, you mentioned what happened in Brooklyn. We've seen surprises across the country. Um, and I, I wish I were smart enough to tell you I know how this is, this is going to play out. I know Democrats who are sitting here today saying, oh, it's a terrible mistake for Democrats to be talking about single-payer health care or to be saying some of these, what they say are extreme things, um, or taking extreme positions uh, uh, to the left. Uh, there are other Democrats who say, wait a minute, that is where the passion is in the Democratic Party. You're not going to turn people out to vote this November unless you listen to that passion and you reflect it and you encourage those young people, those the women who are running, the uh, people of color, people who are passionate, passionate about issues, you're not going to have the energy that you need in the Democratic Party to win elections. That's going to sort itself out between now and November the 6th of this year. And then we're going to see an even bigger uh, sorting out that's going to happen after that, because immediately, the, the, as soon as that, the votes are counted on the night and the morning of November 7th, um, the gun goes off, and we're off and running for 2020 among the Democrats. I mean, I can think of, what, 20 or 25 of them right now who want to run for president. Maybe they're, somebody told me the other day, they think they're 40. Um, a lot of Democrats want to run for president. So that's going to be fascinating. And um, I've seen, you know, mortal combat among Democrats and Republicans. This one is really, really interesting. So um, hang on to your hats. Um, so the question about local press, you're absolutely right. I am in mourning over the loss of so many newspapers and robust news gathering organizations around this country. I lament the fact that newspapers have closed down, reporters have been laid off, there's been so much downsizing. Um, I, I hear from state legislators that reporters don't cover what they are doing in state capitals around the country, that local, uh, uh, local politics doesn't get covered. I went to a county commissioner's gathering a few years ago. I spoke at one of their national conferences, and several, a number of them said to me, nobody, nobody covers us anymore. Um, we are worse off as a country, as a, as a citizenry, if we're not covering what's going on. So I lament it, I deplore it. But you know what? There is a little bit of a silver lining in that in more and more places around the country, you are seeing digital news operations pop up. They don't have the resources that the newspapers used to have and the TV stations and so forth, but they are, they are doing some really fine work. And you see them in cities from um, Austin, Texas, Dallas to uh, Minneapolis. So it's happening around the country, but it's small. It's... It's, um, it's not well organized, and, uh, and, and the savior, frankly, has become a nonprofit foundations. They are putting money into these, into these uh, media ventures. And in some cases, it's people with deep pockets who, who believe in journalism and care about journalism. But it's something for all of us to pay attention to. I'm really glad you asked that question. Before we give Judy um, a round of thanks, uh, I just want to make a few announcements. First of all, there's been a lot of discouragement out here tonight. So I have an antidote to this. And that is, if you are discouraged, come back to Duke and visit us. <laughs> because we are surrounded by bright young people and there's nothing like being surrounded by bright young people. We've seen the Parkland students. There is hope in uh, the next generation coming up. If you can't make it down to Duke and Sanford, however, 
we have events coming to you. Sanford Summer Welcome Events for Reason Graduates will be held in August, is happening in five top regions across the country, including DC. We have something called Terry Tuesdays events. It's a series kicking, that will be kicking off in September with programs tailored specially for DC alumni who are looking to challenge themselves on how to be outrageously ambitious in both their personal and professional lives. And we also have Take a Sanford Student to Work Day <laughs> during the fall break in October. And alumni can host Sanford students at their job, including the news hour, yes, <laughs> for an engaging experience for both our alumni and students, followed by a regional networking reception for all hosts and participants. So we hope you'll continue to connect with Duke and with Sanford. And let's give Judy and Fritz a round of applause.